Welcome to the fourth lecture in this series on Python programming. And let's go ahead and get started and see what we're going to learn today. Today we're concentrating on chapters 8 and 10 in our Think Python book. So chapter 8 is going to go into strings and 10 is going to go into lists. And I like putting these two together because they really complement each other. And a lot of things that you can do with strings, you can do the same thing with lists. So they go together really, really well. Let's go ahead and jump into chapter eight first. So what is a string? A string in Python is basically just a collection, a collection or a sequence of characters in the case of a string. So I can set a variable such as fruit equal to the string value banana, B-A-N-A-N-A. -A -N -A. I can then actually ask for the specific character located at the first position in the string fruit, and I'm going to set that equal to letter. What letter do you think I would get when I did this operation? Well, if you said the letter A, you would be correct. And just like in any other programming languages, we start with zero. So that number in the brackets here associated with the variable fruit, we call that an index. And that's going to indicate which character in the sequence that you want. And we number them from zero to however many we need. These indices must be an integer value. There's no such thing as a 1.5 or a 2.5. That just doesn't exist. That'll get you an error. So one other thing to remember about strings is that strings are considered to be immutable. They cannot change. So if I were to say here and try to set fruit equal to another value or to change a specific character in that, I can't do that. That string remains the same until I'm done running my program. But what I can do is I can change the string slightly by creating a whole new string with what I need. Python's got a really interesting built-in function called len, L-E-N, and it's short for length, and it's going to return the number of characters in a string. So again, I've got my fruit, and if I say L-E-N, and I put fruit in the parentheses, passing it as an argument, I get six. So B-A-N-A-N-A, -A -N -A, six, six letters. Now, if I want to process one character at a time, starting at the beginning, and count through each character in turn, that's called a traversal. I'm traversing through the string. I'm walking through it from the beginning to end, step by step. You can see here in my coding example, I've got two different ways that'll actually do the same thing. Whichever way you choose is fine. The first one, I have a counter here, index equal to zero. While my counter is less than how many letters I have in the word fruit. So it'll start out as zero and go up to six. Letter equals fruit with my index in the square brackets. And I can print the letter and then increment the index. So it will then print B-A-N-A-N-A, -A -A, each letter by itself. I can also do this using a for loop with my in indicator. So if I say for letter in fruit, what that's going to do is letter is going to be assigned to the first one and then the second letter and then the third and so on. I've got my colon at the end of both my while and my for like I always do. But in the for, I just have one statement, print letter. The for portion of this with letter in fruit, it actually does a few different things. It does this letter equals fruit index and it increments the index as it goes through. So it's a little bit more of a shorthand way of doing the same exact thing. Here, 
is a graphical representation of what it looks like using the index and going through the word banana. The index zero is actually in front of the B and the one A and so on and so forth. I can do things to strings such as slice a string, which means I'm going to take a segment of the string and create a brand new string from it. So here I've got S is my string and I've got it equal to the phrase Monty Python. If I were to say S and it put a square bracket and put two indices in here, it is going to create a substring that starts at index zero and goes through index five. So zero, one, two, three, four. So it's going to give you the word Monty. I can do the same thing, not starting at zero and going from six through 12. And that would then give me the second half of the word or Python. I can set these values equal to a new variable, and that's how you can create a new string from an old string. If I want to do a shorthand version of just the first three letters, I can put a blank instead of a zero. That's going to give me B-A-N, the first three letters. I can also say fruit three colon blank. What do you think that gets me? That gets me the last three letters. What do you think blank colon blank means? Try it out in your Python compiler and let me know what you think. You can also search through a string for either a particular character or a special character. So let's take a look at this function. Read through the function. What does this function do? Well, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to take a word and a character in through its arguments. And the function name is called find. It is going to go through the word from zero to the end of the word. And it's going to look for a specific character that was passed in through the arguments. If the character is found, which is in this if statement, it's going to return the index, which is going to be the location in the word where that character was found. Now it's one thing to notice, it will be the first occurrence of this character. So if it occurs multiple times, it's only going to give you back the first time it finds it. Lastly, if there are no characters found in the word that are the indicated character, it's going to return a negative one. And a negative one would be a good index because in Python, our indices are always going to be positive numbers. In Python, strings have a whole bunch of built-in methods. And I suggest that you go into the, the documentation and look at them yourselves. But I've pulled out a few of them. Some of the common operations that we have that we like to use are things such as upper, lower, and the word in. When we use methods for strings, we use that dot notation. We talked about that a little bit before. In this case, we would take the variable that is a string and do the dot notation to it. So for example, in my code here, my word is banana. That's the string. My new word is word dot upper. So what that's going to do is it's going to give me an all uppercase version of the word. So as you can see here, the original word is all lowercase banana and the new word is all uppercase banana. Method calls are called the invocation of the method. We invoke the method in order to use it. We can also use the in like we 
saw that a minute ago with the our loops, right? Our for loop. A in banana, it gives a true or false. You can do comparisons with strings, and most relational operators will actually work on a string. I can use the double equal sign, which it gives an equivalency, and it will say, are these two strings equal? But what about greater than and less than? How could one word be greater than or less than another word? Well, in Python, they use alphabetical order. For example, it will see all uppercase letters coming before all lowercase. So lowercase will have a greater value. Smaller strings will also be considered less than a longer string. So if I have apple and apples, apples will be considered larger. And then finally, just going A through Z, Z will actually have a greater value than A. So for example, your word pineapple comes before banana, but it's because the P in pineapple is capitalized and the B in banana is not. Moving into our segment in lists, just like a string is a sequence of values of characters specifically, a list can be a sequence of values of anything. We say that a list has elements or items such as these. So we've got 10, 20, 30, 40 in the first list. And the second list has crunchy frog, ram bladder, lark vomit. We can also have what we call a nested list, which is a list within a list. So here I've got a list that is all kinds of different data types. The first one is a string, spam. The second one's a floating variable, 2.0. The third is an integer, 5. And then the last one is a list containing the values 10 and 20. Now, a big difference between strings and lists is that lists are mutable, which means I can change a value in a list at any position at any time during my program. Just like we walked through and traversed those strings, we can do the exact same things in a list. So to print, I can do the same thing I did with printing each character. I can print each item in my list by using four cheese in cheeses print the individual cheese. I can write or update elements using the two different calls of len length, which is going to give me the number in the list. And range is going to give a list of indices starting at zero, going to whatever that length is minus one. So then I can say for i in range, len numbers, which is going to give me zero through however, however many items, can be found in the list numbers. Just like we did in strings, lists have a whole bunch of operations that can be done to them. So for example, I have two here. The first is the plus operator or kind of like an addition. If I have a equal to one, two, three and b equal to four, five, six, I can say c equals a plus b. What that is going to do is create a new list concatenating all of the items together. So you'll end up with a list of the values 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6. Next, I can use the multiplication operator or the asterisk. And what that is going to do, just like it does with strings, it is going to repeat the list given the number of times. So for example, I can use it here and I say I've got a list 
that has a zero contained in it. And if I multiply that by four, I now have a new list with zero four times. I can also use that multiplier to repeat a list an indicated number of times. So for example, on this bottom one, I've got a list of one, two, three. And if I do a asterisk three, it's gonna take that list and repeat it three times. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I can take a list and break it up into segments of itself, or I can do what's called a list slice. So here I've got a full list of the letters A through F, and I'm storing it in T. If I want to take the items in the list at indices one through three, that would be one and two, I can say T square bracket one dot dot three square bracket. Now, one thing to notice, it's not going to include this last indice, so it's going to start at index one and give me B and do index two and give me C. If I want to take a slice starting at the beginning of the list and just indicating how many I want, I can say T colon four. Technically it starts at zero, but you don't have to put that zero. So that would give me A, B, C, D, which would give me one, two, three, four values or indices zero, one, two, three. I could also do it the opposite. If I say T and I just give a three with nothing for the ending, it will start at indice zero, one, two, three and then give me everything from that index through the end of the list. So in this case, it would give me characters D, E, and F. Lists do have methods of their own that allow you to do different manipulations on that list. So for example, I have T1 equals A, B, and C, and I have T2 equal to D and E. If I say T1 extend T2 using that dot notation, it's going to take T2 and add it to the end of T1. So my new T1 is going to be A, B, C, D, E. I can also do the same thing with a method called append, again using the dot notation. If I say append the character D to my list T, it's going to end up being A, B, C, and D. The last method I'm going to point out here is that we do have a sort method, and it is gonna take your list and sort it. Now, if it has strings, it will do it using that alphabetical sort that we talked about previously. If it's numerical, it will be in ascending order. So your lower numbers will be first and your higher numbers will be last. Lists have all kinds of methods that are built in. And if you would like to see more, go ahead and go over to the Python documentation and see all that's available to you. I can also delete elements of a list in a few different ways. I've got one that's called pop and one that's called remove. Pop will take out an element based on the index. So in this case, I say T, I want to pop the value that's at index one, and I'm setting it equal to a variable X. Now, if I were to print T, it's just going to be A and C. And if I print X, it's gonna have that value of B. Here, I've got a remove on the right-hand side. And if I say T equals ABC and I want to remove B, it's just going to delete it out of the list and my new list is just A and C. 
The big difference between pop and remove is that pop will return a value. So you can see pop is being set to a variable, remove is not. Remove just deletes it out of the list. I also have a DEL, which stands for delete. Here I've got my list ABC. I say delete T1, which is going to delete the value in index one, so it gives me A and C. This method is very similar to the remove method. You can also combine that DEL command with the slice that we just looked at before, where it will delete a specific slice. So here I'm telling it to delete starting at index one, one, two, three, and four. So it is actually going to delete B, C, D, and E from this list. So if I go ahead and print it afterward, it's going to give me just A and F. So this line right here is combining the list slices from the previous slide to the deleting elements from this slide. Strings and lists are quite comparable, and we had talked about this in an earlier lecture. A string is just a sequence of characters, and a list is a sequence of values. You can have a list of characters that is not a string. So just as we had in the previous example, we had A, B, C, D. Technically, that's not a string. It is a list of characters. Here, I can actually convert from a full string to a list by using just the command list and sending it a string. So S is a string value of a word spam. I use the list method. When I call T and have it print, it's going to print out S P A M and it, now, it is now a list of each of the characters. Here I can split a list based on a specific character or a delimiter. In this case, I've got the delimiter to be the dash. So my original string is spam, spam, spam with dashes in between. I can then take that using the dot notation, say split and then the delimiter. Then if I print out this new list, it's going to give me the spam, spam, spam with the delimiters removed. This is very good for using file names and getting rid of extensions. Here I've got a string method called split and that will take a sentence and break it up into a list of words. So it is going to basically do the same thing as the delimiter, assuming that you want a space but it's split, not sending it any arguments. So then if I print out the list, it's going to say pinning for the fjords. Last but not least, I can actually do the opposite of a split and do a join where I take a list and I create a string from it. So in this case, I have my delimiter is going to be a space. So you need to indicate how you want to join each of these, what character you want between them. So I'm going to say a space. I say delimiter, which is a character, dot join the list. Then when I print out this string, it's going to give me the full sentence, a single string, of each of these elements put together with a space in between. Now let's take a look at objects and values. So are the following variables the same? A equals banana and B equals banana. Well, what is the same? What, is, what do I mean when I say same? I have two, act two different definitions of the word same. So I can say, do they have the same values, such as in the top graphic, where A equals one, two, three, B equals one, two, three. They both have the values one, two, three. But in this, you can see they are separate objects. 
the arrows are not pointing to the same object. Now down here at the bottom is a different type of same. This same means that A is pointing to the same, this object one, two, three, and B is pointing to this object one, two, three. In the bottom case, if I make a change, so if I get rid of the three at the end and it's just one, two, both A and B now are equal to the list one, two. In the top case, if I get rid of the three in A, A is now equal to one, two, but B still has one, two, three. So when we program, we say that the top is actually equivalent. And that indicates that they have the same elements. In the bottom case, we say they are identical. So we say they are the same object. So when we program, we don't actually use the word same because we have multiple meanings. We tend to use the words equivalent and identical instead. So when I say are the variables the same, most of the times when programmers are indicating identical, same object. So let's take a look. Are the following variables the same? So we've indicated we don't really like the word same. So are these two variables equivalent or identical? These two are equivalent. They have the same elements, but they're not actually pointing to the same object. We know this because in Python, if when you say A equals and you give it an assignment, it goes and finds a space of memory. It goes and finds a specific space of memory for A, and then it goes and finds a different space of memory for B. That's how we know that these are just equivalent and not the same object. I can also use lists just as I use any other type of variable. So I can pass a list to a function. Now when I do that, it gets a reference to the list. So when I say that, typically when a variable is passed to a function, any changes made in that function stay in that function. And a function cannot modify the original variable. A list does not happen that way. A list, when you pass it to the function, the function can modify the list. What it sends is the address of where that list is located. So therefore, it's going to change your original list. So for example, here, I have defined a function where I delete the first item in my list. When the list is sent, it does a DEL to the item in index zero. If I go to use this function and I define my list as letters, and then I say delete head letters, it's going to modify the original list and get rid of the A. So just be careful when you're using lists in functions and know that any changes made are permanent changes in your program. So to wrap up, we started out in chapter eight discussing strings and all of the different ways that we can work with strings. Then we moved on to chapter 10 and we saw a lot of the similarities between lists and strings. And then we kind of wrapped up with some manipulations of these lists, like taking the slice and deleting and joining and things like that. I hope you enjoyed this lecture and we will see you in lecture five.